Good day and welcome. Thank you for joining today's IASWA chapter webinar. We are delighted to have you here and we hope that you will find the presentation informative and engaging. Before we, being, uh, before we begin today's webinar, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which we gather today. The Wajak people of the Nunga Nation uh, have lived and cared for this land for tens of thousands of years, and their cultural and spiritual connection to the land continues to this day. I pay my respect to their elders past, present, and emerging. Allow me to elaborate on the history of our chapter. ISWA chapter was established recently in 2019. Our goal is to organize around 9 to 10 webinars annually, each covering engaging and informative topics. We aim to invite distinguished and reputable speakers from all over the world to share their knowledge and skills with our members. I'm honored to inform you that inform you that our WA chapter has been awarded the prestigious best IES chapter award for two years in a row for 2021 and 2022. We remain committed to maintaining our standard of excellence by continuing to organize top-notch events and providing valuable opportunities to our members. Apart from our webinars, we are thrilled to announce a major networking event scheduled for mid-year to be held at one of the premium venues in Perth. We plan to invite one or two distinguished speakers from both industry and academia. The good news is that members of IES will enjoy a considerable discount of 50 to 80 percent on registration fee. So if you are not yet an IES member, we invite you to join today and take advantage of all the benefits and opportunities that come with membership. We will continue to organize more technical and networking events in the future, and we look forward to your support and participation. So without further ado, let's get started. Dr. Hai Wang will now introduce our esteemed guest speaker for today's events. Dr. Hai, the stage is yours. All right, thank you. Thank you, Moet, for your uh, introduction for our chapter. So today is our great honor to invite uh, to have, you know, Doc, uh, Professor Yang to, to be here, you know, virtually to give us, you know, the presentation. So uh, first of all, I would like to give a brief intro introduction for Professor Yang. So Professor Chen Guang Yang is the leader of Robot Teleoperation Group and Professor of Robotics at Br uh, Bristol Robotics Lab, UK. He received a PhD degree from National University of Singapore in 2010 and a postdoc training in human robotics from the Imperial College London, uh, UK. He was awarded UK EPSRC UKRI Innovation Fellowship in 2018 and an individual EU Marie Curie International Incoming Fellowship in 2011. He is a supervisor of an Edge 2020 Marie Curie Standard European Fellow for uh, 2021 to 2020. As a lead author, he won the Attribute Transactions on Robotics Best Paper Award in 2012 and Attribute Transactions on Neural Networks and Learning Systems Outstanding Paper Award in 2022. He was titled Highly Cited Researcher by Web of Science for three times. He authored two monographs on robotics published on Springer 2016 and CRC Press in 2021. He's a fellow of Institution of Mechanical Engineers, Institution of Engineering and Technology, IET, and British Computer so uh, Society. He's a co-chair of IEEB Technical uh, Committee on Collaborative Automation for Flexible Manufacturing and a co-chair of IEEB Technical Committee on Biomechatronics and Biorobotic Systems. His research interest lies in human-robot interaction and intelligent system design, so let's well, uh, warmly welcome our distinguished speaker, Professor Yang, to give us today's presentation. Thank, thank you, you, Hai. Thank you for your uh, introduction. And uh, uh, thank you, Amoyad, for your uh, introduction as well. Uh, please let me uh, to start sharing my uh, slides. Yeah, OK. So uh, Okay, uh, hi, is that okay? Can you uh, see my screen now? Yes, yes, we can see it. Thank you. Okay, that's great. Yeah, uh, 
Uh, this uh, is really my uh, honor and uh, pleasure to give this uh, talk on my research uh, on uh, robot skill learning and uh, human-like control. Yeah, just to let you know that uh, uh, I'm very glad to uh, I'm I just joined the uh, Industry uh, Electronics Society as a new uh, Adcom member from uh, January uh, this year. So I'm quite happy to uh, give this talk. Uh, to our Western uh, Australian section. Um, yeah, please uh, uh, let me uh, start my talk. Um, as introduced uh, by Hai, my uh, background uh, is uh, control and uh, learning. Uh, I did my PhD uh, in uh, control theory and uh, uh, I started uh, to apply advanced control on a uh, robot and the modeling of human control uh, from my postdoc at uh, Imperial College. And the recent years, I uh, do more research on uh, machine learning, especially imitation learning uh, for robots to uh, capture and uh, learn human uh, manipulation skills. OK, uh, so uh, my name is uh, Chen Guangyang. Uh, feel free to call me uh, Charlie. Uh, I'm from uh, Bristol Robotics Laboratory, which is the largest uh, robotics center in the United Kingdom. And uh, as implies by the uh, title uh, of my talk, uh, today I'm going to uh, talk uh, about two research uh, research lines. The first one is from control point of view, as uh, represented by our award-winning uh, paper uh, on human-like robot adapt adaptation of force and uh, uh, impedance. We from the observation of uh, human motor behaviors uh, in the presence of uh, interaction forces, uh, we uh, build some uh, model, uh, computational um, model of uh, how our uh, human uh, limbs uh, adapt force and uh, interaction for uh, various, various tasks. For example, when we do tasks like uh, uh, carving, we not only need to uh, adapt the force, we also need to adapt uh, the stiffness of our hand, uh, especially uh, the wrist by co-contraction of muscles to perform the task uh, successfully. Uh, by modeling the uh, human motor uh, behavior uh, using uh, control uh, models, uh, we will uh, be able to uh, extract the uh, delicate manipulation skills uh, from the uh, observation of uh, human's performance. And then we can apply these models back to robot to enable robot to perform some uh, human-like uh, manipulation uh, behavior. On the other side, um, I also uh, do research on uh, teaching by demonstration, uh, which is the uh, same as imitation learning. This is the most uh, straightforward and uh, effective way to transfer our manipulation skills uh, to a uh, robot. We um, integrated uh, the uh, dynamic movement primitive method and the uh, Gaussian uh, mix model to, uh, to generate a better, uh, to produce better generalization uh, capacity for uh, robot uh, learning. We also uh, combined uh, neural uh, control technology uh, to further uh, enhance the uh, reliability and the robustness of the uh, skill uh, learning and uh, generalization. Uh, and this work uh, was an outstanding paper award from HPE transaction on neural networks and uh, learning system. Let me start with uh, the modeling of uh, human uh, motor uh, behavior. Uh, so as you can see from this page, uh, when uh, we, uh, as human uh, subjects, when we uh, do, uh, let's say, the simple uh, task of moving from star point to the target point along a street line, uh, if there are some um, force field uh, applied to uh, our uh, hand, uh, as you can imagine, on the left-hand side, in in the uh, force field of this uh, divergent uh, force field, which is called DF, when your hand 
is pushing either to the left or to the uh, right if you are not exactly if your move a trajectory has a trajectory not exactly fall into the straight line you can imagine you will be pushed uh, either to the left or to the right uh, while uh, the force field is applied without the knowledge uh, of the human subject and it was withdrawn also without uh, the, the, the knowledge of the human subject so we observe that uh, through uh, learning uh, even in, in in the force field after a few iterations, human subjects are able to restore back to the straight line, uh, even if at the beginning uh, the motion trajectory was uh, disturbed. Uh, so same as uh, on the uh, right hand side for the so-called uh, VF uh, force field. Um, the difference is that the uh, DF force field is bidirectional, uh, either to the left or to the right, where on the right hand side, uh, the VF force field is uh, the, the direction is pointing, uh, as you can see, all the arrows are pointing to the uh, upper left. So it's kind of uh, predictable. Uh, therefore, uh, human, our human use uh, quite a different uh, strategy to cope with these two different uh, force fields. On the left, uh, all the human subjects uh, adapt stiffness. As you can see, the stiffness um, ellipse uh, which uh, were in green color before the learning and uh, red color after learning uh, obviously all the uh, ellipses uh, are elongated through the uh, vertical uh, direction which is the unstable direction of the df force field and on the right hand side uh, uh, all the uh, human subject they try to adapt to the force uh, instead of stiffness to compensate for the uh, disturbances. Another uh, interesting uh, experiment by Musa uh, Ivadi at the Chicago Institute of Re uh, Rehabilitation shows that um, in, the, uh, in another kind of force field, uh, let's say uh, we, we call it a circular force field uh, in which the uh, force uh, pointing from the from the center of a circle along the uh, radial direction and uh, uh, the amplitude of the uh, force is uh, depend on the uh, is actually created by uh, a vertical spring uh, if if the, uh, the the if you are closing to the uh, center of the circle you will uh, be pushed with a large amplitude of force. If you are close to the boundary of the circles, you will feel a less uh, force. When, uh, because the force is uh, created by a uh, vertical spring, so when we try to increase the uh, vertical springs stiffness, let's say from 200 to 2000, we observe that uh, in bo both uh, large circular force field and the uh, smaller uh, circular force okay. field, the human subjects demonstrate the, the same behavior. They, they try to be uh, more rigid to compensate for the force field to uh, keep the straight line motion if the vertical spring is softer and they will be more compliant to move along the curvature if the vertical spring is uh, more rigid, harder. And interesting, when you uh, withdraw this force field without the knowledge of the subject, which we call as catch trial, this human subject, they still tend to move along the learn the trajectory, the curve the trajectory, rather than uh, move back to the straight line immediately. So from this observation, uh, we conclude that uh, our human uh, motor control systems should be able to adapt force, impedance, and the reference trajectory. Uh, because as we can see from Chibumsa Ivadi's experiment, uh, even if the force field uh, were withdrawn. The human subjects still tend to follow the curved trajectory 
Uh, uh, so that from control point of view implies the reference trajectory has been uh, adapted. Therefore, they propose a, a adaptation law for all these three elements in the controller. And by handcrafted uh, uh, cost function, uh, we will be able to de derive the uh, learning laws from by minimization of this uh, cost function. So that's uh, how how do we adapt uh, the talk, uh, the joint talk, uh, impedance, and uh, trajectory. Okay. So first, when we got uh, our control model, uh, we uh, in the simulation we try to reproduce the result as we observed in the uh, human motor uh, uh, experiment. We uh, in the simulation uh, environment, we create uh, uh, the force, uh, circular force field, either the, the uh, large uh, circular force field with small curvature or small, uh, smaller uh, circular force field with larger curvature. Uh, we observe that uh, uh, the, in the simulation, uh, the, the, the road arm uh, is the trajectory uh, in the uh, green lines. Uh, it uh, it's uh, it demonstrated the same uh, the same uh, uh, trend as we we observe in the uh, human subjects e e experiment. Uh, the trajectory is shifting uh, from the uh, center to the uh, the boundary of the uh, circle the the circle and the reference trajectory as uh, represented by the uh, dash dotted line. As you can see, it's also shifting uh, from left to the right uh, along the direction of the force field. While uh, in uh, Buddha's experiment in the uh, DF and the VF force field, uh, our computational model also demonstrates uh, almost the same behavior as we observed on human subjects. Uh, in the DF force field, uh, uh, it, it is, is able to uh, restore back to the uh, straight line motion after learning and after learning the, uh, the, the motion trajectory even uh, stricter than before. And this is caused by adaptation of uh, uh, especially stiffness uh, and particularly the stiffness along the horizontal direction uh, because in the planar motion, stiffness is a two by two matrix and the, uh, we have four trajectory as shown here. And the uh, only the first element uh, K11, which is uh, the stiffness along the uh, hor uh, horizontal uh, direction, uh, this stiffness particularly uh, significantly uh, increased, while others, other three elements uh, increased not that much. While in VF force field, uh, we see uh, the uh, roped arm use a more uh, force adaptation to compensate for uh, the disturbances. Okay, so now we we, we uh, through the simulation we can uh, justify that our computation model uh, a valid uh, good model to explain uh, motor uh, motor control behavior. And next we apply our model to uh, uh, our arm to uh, further test. Can we uh, of generate a superior performance, a manipulation performance uh, than the uh, conventional impedance control. So we uh, chose uh, two experiments here. One is drilling, another one is cutting for this uh, uh, inter uh, inter uh, for, uh, interactive uh, uh, tasks with uh, force contact. Uh, we compare our adaptive control uh, strategy with uh, the conventional fixed uh, parameter uh, impedance controller. Uh, in the drilling task, we compare with the high, uh, rigid stiffness control. Okay, here comes our adaptive control, and we can see our performance is better in the term that uh, it causes less damage to the surface and a smooth drilling. And it's more obvious for the carting. Uh, you can see the Rigid stiffness control it cause how much damage to the service while well, our controller is it's very smooth. Uh, the the cutting uh, is uh, the, it cuts uh, uh, nicely uh, without uh, much damage to the surface. 
uh, we also apply our uh, adaptive control strategy on our uh, robot fingers. Uh, we did this experiment on shadow uh, robot hand. Uh, it's the task uh, is that the robot robot fingers follow uh, the captured motion of human hand to do uh, to uncap a bottle, and uh, we test uh, our first. We test our adaptive controller. Uh, we adapt uh, the 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 joint torques and uh, the stiffness of each joint of the finger, and you can see uh, the robot for, can successfully uncaps the bottle. And if you just use the position control, uh, just use the motion control uh, on the uh, shadow of the hand. You can see the motion is not very sta stable when it gets in touch with uh, uh, the bottle. The bottle can be easily knocked down because of the unbalanced force. So this demonstrates uh, uh, that uh, our human-like adaptive controller uh, definitely produce a much uh, stable and reliable motion uh, than the uh, uh, default motion controller uh, of the shadow of the hand. Okay, so uh, in the past we we focus on the uh, impedance uh, adaptation at the end effector uh, of the roped arm. Well, um, towards the next generation of uh, collaborative robot. Uh, when when we uh, think about robot uh, sharing workspace with our human co-workers, we inevitably get in touch with the robot, uh, maybe not only at the end effector, but uh, also at uh, the joints. So when human and human uh, work together uh, uh, in, in a closed space, uh, so uh, it's uh, inevitable they, they may uh, touch each other. So for the, for the robot, we should not only consider the compliance at the end effect, but also compliance at each joint to guarantee the uh, safety when the robot um, get in touch uh, with a uh, human co-worker. So we uh, proposed a so-called hierarchical uh, uh, impedance controller. We consider a two priorities first for the uh, end effector for the task uh, to uh, for the task of interaction with the environment or objects uh, second priority is uh, uh, the joint space uh, compliance uh, in case a robot uh, get a physical contact with a human uh, co-worker so uh, this uh, shows uh, the uh, multi uh, hierarch uh, hierarchy uh, structure uh, of our controller. Uh, we, we test the performance on soya robot. So the, the first uh, job for the robot is to maintain the posture and uh, position of the end effect unchanged and the human uh, partner is interacting uh, only in the joint space. Uh, you can see uh, in the presence of physical uh, interaction, uh, the robot joints keep the plant and the end effect keep unchanged. So next, we uh, send a command to the robot to move up and down, uh, follow a, a sinusoidal uh, trajectory. And at the same time, uh, the human partner is uh, disturbing the robot, uh, purposely uh, disturbing the robot physically. And yet the robot can uh, keep the motion of the end effect unchanged. Okay, so uh, in the previous uh, experiment, we see that we uh, created the compl uh, compliance in the uh, joint space and uh, the end effect motion uh, were not uh, affected. Uh, that is because, that is because uh, uh, as a soya robot or, or the box robot to be shown in this video, uh, each arm of this robot uh, has seven degree of freedom, uh, which is larger than six degree freedom uh, in our uh, Cartesian space. So it has kinematic uh, redundancy. By using, uh, by exploiting uh, kinematic redundancy, we can 
uh, use a now space motion to do some task like obstacle avoidance. Uh, the now space motion uh, in the drawn space would not affect the motion of the end effect. Uh, so in this uh, test, we attach uh, paper boxes on the wall to represent uh, the obstacles. Uh, in this teleoperation, uh, pick up and place teleoperation. In the first test, you see the elbow of the right arm bump into the uh, paper box. So the uh, collision happened here. And the next, we implemented our uh, obstacle avoidance. And as you can see, the for the same picking up and place job, the elbow of the box robot purposely avoid collision with the paper box. Well, as a human operator, he does not need to worry about this obstacle avoidance. He just uh, need to concentrate on the motion of the uh, gripper. Uh, the robot will do the obstacle avoidance by itself. So this demonstrates uh, the idea of a shared control. Uh, so uh, by using shared control, human uh, teleoperator does not need to worry uh, too much about the drawn space motion. And uh, we uh, combine uh, the, the technologies uh, on joint space compliance and uh, obstacle avoidance and apply this for uh, teleoperation for minimum invasive uh, surgery. Uh, in this uh, tele-surgery uh, experiment, we, we, we test our uh, control uh, uh, technologies uh, on this uh, tele-surgery uh, scenario. Um, we we uh, we have to uh, highlight that for this uh, minimum invasive surgery, the surgical tool is working through a very small hole. Uh, in the real uh, scenario, it's for example, uh, we have to uh, open a hole on the uh, on the let's say our uh, abdomen, and the surgical tool need to uh, go inside that hole to work inside our body. Uh, in the experiment, we, we use a phantom, uh, not a, a real human uh, patient. Um, in this uh, phantom, uh, we, we put a camera inside of the phantom so we can see the tip of the surgical tool on the up uh, left corner. Uh, this uh, small, this uh, sub panel, we, we can see the motion of the surgical tool inside the uh, phantom. And uh, on the uh, right hand side of the, uh, the video, you see uh, uh, the human uh, partner uh, stand uh, beside the robot. Uh, in the uh, real uh, surg uh, surgic surgical room, there are always uh, an assistant stand by because something may happen. For example, the patient may be bleeding and the, the human uh, assistant needed to uh, wipe. Uh, and uh, when he uh, walks around, uh, sometimes uh, he may be uh, get in touch uh, with the robot. And in this uh, experiment, we ask this human assistant to purposely disturbing the robot to test the robustness of our uh, control performance. So as you can see, the surgical tool uh, is working through a very small hole, and this small hole uh, Cause, cause a constraint to the uh, control uh, problem. That's called the RCM, remote uh, uh, center of uh, motion. And uh, as the, and yet the even with the uh, even in the presence of the disturbance and the constraint of the small hole, and uh, uh, you can see yet the tip of the surgical tool can follow well the trajectories commanded by the uh, teleoperator. So the teleoperator are uh, using uh, a uh, joystick, uh, uh, particularly uh, Omega-7 in this uh, experiment to command the surgical tool to follow uh, the uh, motion. For example, uh, for suturing or for cutting, uh, we have to send the command to the robot. And uh, the robot, and you can see the surgical tool, uh, the tip of surgical tool follows a uh, hundred percent accurate of the commanded uh, 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 position. Uh, even if 
uh, in the presence of the RCM constraint and the physical disturbances caused by uh, this uh, human pattern. Uh, in the calibration, we uh, sometimes we we need more uh, degree of freedom to control the robot. Uh, because sometimes we, we, we feel that uh, the joystick or motion capture are not enough. Uh, because we want to capture not only motion, but also the intention uh, of uh, the human uh, calibrator. So we try to uh, use uh, uh, electromyography signal to improve the calibration uh, performance. Um, most time we use uh, this uh, mile armband, uh, which has eight channels to capture the uh, electro surface uh, electro myography uh, signal, uh, so that we can uh, use uh, EMG signal to uh, estimate uh, the, for example, the the muscle co-contraction uh, in order to predict the uh, stiffness uh, of our uh, our motion intention of uh, our arms. Uh, in in this uh, test, we we want to show uh, the advantage of using uh, EMG signal in this uh, human in the loop uh, control. Uh, teleoperation uh, is a typical uh, scenario of a human in the loop. So with human in the loop uh, for the teleoperation, we can rely on the uh, the the responses of uh, humans to tune the controller on the uh, robot uh, so it's uh, in comparison to shared control it's another uh, strategy so usually we uh, leave the uh, low level uh, control uh, to the robot and for the high level cognitive task, we leave to the human uh, operator. And in this uh, uh, in this uh, experiment, uh, we ask teleoperate the robot to, to pick up uh, a box with unknown uh, payload. Actually, it, it was quite heavy uh, with um, uh, it, it's about uh, two kilogram up to the limit, uh, payload limit of the box robot. And at the beginning, you can see uh, with under high gain control, instability happens, a lot of oscillations. The robot was shaking because of instability. And the next, we, if we use a low gain control, the robot can hardly uh, pick up the box because it could not produce large enough force. And finally, we use our uh, variable gain control. The controller gain was set by the uh, muscle uh, signal from the operator. When, when you pick up the object through the joystick, actually uh, there is a force feedback to the human operator. So when your hand is applied a force, uh, Voluntarily, you will increase your 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 strains. Uh, you will have muscle uh, contraction, and this will increase the EMG signal, so that the robot know you are using a larger strain strength. So the robot will also increase the controller gain uh, accordingly to produce a larger force. And when the job is done, when you relax, the robot will reduce the control gain to relax as well. So this shows the idea of a uh, human in the loop control to use the uh, mode, human motor control strategy to adapt the controller uh, on the robot. Because uh, for robot uh, working in unknown environment to interacting with unknown objects or unknown payload, you cannot tune the control parameters perfectly in advance because everything is unknown. Uh, even if you tune it well for one task, it may fail for another task. So by uh, using uh, the human in the loop control strategy, uh, we can uh, take advantage of uh, human's decision to adapt the controller 
on the root side. So similarly, we use the same idea for human uh, robot uh, interaction. Uh, we use uh, the armband one on the uh, upper and uh, the forearms to measure the uh, arm stiffness of the uh, human uh, co-worker so that we can uh, adapt the uh, controller on the robot uh, for the best uh, uh, collaborative uh, control performance. Uh, for uh, uh, computational uh, simplicity, we, uh, we can linearize the model and then we use a LQR method uh, to uh, minimize uh, a cost function. In the uh, experiment, uh, we, we choose the, the task of uh, sawing a piece of wood. So usually if we have two people, one on each side uh, to do this task collaboratively, it will be a, a smoother. Now we replace uh, one person uh, with robot. So now it's a human partner and a robot doing this, uh, sawing a piece of uh, task. The robot is equipped with a uh, a force uh, sensor and under admittance control mode. The admittance model can be adapted according to the uh, estimated stiffness through the EMG signals on the human side. So under admittance control mode, you can see uh, the robot can follow well the motion of the human partner. Uh, even if you change the motion frequency or you increase or decrease the uh, uh, range of the uh, motion. Robot can follow, uh, follow you very well, but that's not enough. Uh, we define optimization uh, as uh, to uh, generate the uh, best performance and minimize the effort uh, on the human side. In other words, the robot should provide you uh, as much support and assistance uh, uh, assistance as possible. And after uh, cutting, uh, we, we do uh, uh, some analysis of the collected signal and we see our uh, message. Uh, indeed, uh, you, you can see it's cutting is uh, very uh, nice. Uh, it's very uh, smooth surface, and uh, indeed it uh, costs less effort of human partner. And uh, if we use uh, the fixed controller, you can see uh, the cutting was not as smooth of, as our controller's performance. And even if and it even had a spec, uh, at, that's because at the end of the uh, sawing, uh, the the robot can highly control the, uh, the force, and so that left a spec uh, after the uh, sawing. Okay, uh, let me talk about uh, the uh, learning through, uh, we, <coughs> we introduced our work on uh, human-robot uh, collaboration and the collaboration. Uh, actually, through uh, collaboration or uh, collaboration, the robot actually uh, can capture the manipulation skills uh, from the human partner. So that uh, by taking advantage uh, of uh, the captured skill, the robot can actually learn from uh, the, the uh, human partner such that uh, the robot could replace uh, partly uh, the, the job of the human because for example, in the collaboration, if the robot can uh, learn from the human collaborator, next time the, the robot can do the uh, repetitive task, can do the simple task, uh, so that the human uh, collaborator uh, only uh, do the high level cognitive task. This will significantly reduce uh, the workload uh, of the human uh, operator. Well, for robot to learn the manipulation uh, skills, uh, there are basically uh, two uh, uh, main uh, streams of, of research methodology. One is to use uh, something like uh, 
dynamic dynamic movement primitive or dynamic system is a deterministic deterministic learning. Another way is the other way. Uh, you can use a uh, Gaussian uh, mixture model. Uh, use a uh, hidden uh, Markov. Uh, hidden Markov. Uh, well, uh, the advantage of a deterministic uh, uh, learning, for example, DMP, is that uh, it can build uh, the model from a single demonstration. While uh, Gaussian mixed model, this kind of uh, um, probability. Uh, this distribution based method, they can take advantage of multiple demonstration. And we uh, merged Gaussian mixed model with a dynamic movement primitive so that uh, we can build a deterministic model uh, by uh, multiple demonstration because uh, we we want to take advantage of multiple demo demonstration. Even for our uh, humans, uh, sometimes uh, uh, we cannot do a task properly, perfectly just one time. Uh, if we repeat it, repeat the task a number of times, we and uh, we uh, synthesize uh, the uh, all the demonstrations, we may get a better demonstration by by combining uh, all the, all the uh, demonstration together. Okay, and um, another thing is that we need a uh, segmentation. Uh, this is also very important. Why uh, DMP is called a dynamic movement primitive? Because uh, we usually uh, teach, uh, we usually uh, let the robot to uh, learn by modeling a a a pre so-called primitive, that's basically a subtask. We divide a uh, long horizon task into a number of small subtasks, and uh, uh, each DMP only learn a subtask, which is called a primitive. Um, to demonstrate the idea of uh, uh, segmentation, we use uh, this uh, video show that we teach a robot to write Chinese characters. So. There are uh, uh, tens of thousands of Chinese characters. If you want the robot uh, to follow your hand writing style uh, to write uh, each Chinese character, if you, you you may have to teach all the Chinese characters in the dictionary to the robot. That's very time consuming and boring. But fortunately, there are only limited strokes in Chinese character, uh, similar as there are only 26. Uh, letters in the English alphabet. So by segmentation, when you teach the robot, uh, we can do segmentation uh, to extract each stroke, and then we can recombine these strokes uh, to write something completely new. Uh, for example, in this uh, demo, uh, the first two lines were taught by the human demonstrator, and the next two lines were performed by the robot itself, not taught before. Um, for uh, dynamic movement uh, uh, primitives, we, the, the technology developed in the literature uh, is for a, single, for a single robot arm. Well, for most of daily life uh, job, we, our humans, we use a bimanual manipulation. We use two hands to coordinate, coordinately to complete a, a task. Um, well, if you apply each uh, DMP to uh, a single uh, uh, to a single arm and uh, uh, combine them together, uh, that may be not successful. Uh, as shown uh, in in our demonstration, we. We teach the robot by manual manipulation to flip up a paper or box. Okay, uh, of course the robot can reproduce uh, for the same uh, reproduce the job for the same uh, paper box without any problem. But if you change to a, a, a different size paper box, it can be taller, it can be uh, wider. The robot will fill the job. It, it, it can, cannot generalize well. Okay, 
So now we modify and improve the uh, DMP and uh, propose a so-called coupled DMP. We consider the coordination between uh, two DMPs and our method uh, generates a uh, much better performance uh, for uh, by manual coordinate task. So as uh, you can see, uh, even if we have a different uh, paper boxes, this, uh, all the flipping tasks uh, were very successful. In addition, uh, the uh, conventional DMP only consider uh, uh, as implies as implied by its name. It's called a movement primitive. It conventionally DMP only uh, concerned on uh, motion control. But uh, through this uh, demonstration, we want to show that uh, motion control only is not enough. Okay, we now we we uh, teach the robot how to clean the table by wipe off uh, the crumbs on the table. Now, if the robot reproduce only in motion control mode, you can see the robot cannot uh, wipe off these crumbs very well because there's not there was not sufficient contact force. If we consider hybrid force and motion control, now the robot could reach sufficient sufficiently large force against the table to clean the table. So this shows that uh, we the uh we if we only consider motion that's not enough so we uh need to uh incorporate a force control and even a compliant controller a variable impedance controller for uh, contact reach tasks for example for uh, this uh in this experiment uh we Want to want the robot uh, to mimic uh, our uh, humans uh, our, our humans uh, manipulation to roll a dolph uh, to make it a flat uh, circular shape uh, from uh, a, a dolph. Uh, for this kind of task, uh, we not only need to uh, learn the motion skills. Uh, for example, uh, from which direction shall we apply the roller? We also need to uh, learn the force uh, skills. Uh, how much force should we apply uh, to the dove? And uh, how how compliant should uh, the roller be at a particular angle or position? Uh, this is uh, very uh, important. We uh, teach. Uh, the robot. Uh, we we uh, we uh, equip a roller on the any factor uh, of uh, a Franca robot, and uh, we uh, use a, a, a joystick to teach the robot uh, through calibration at the beginning. And next, we uh, will uh, test uh, the uh, reproduce uh, repro uh, let the robot to reproduce the performance and even generalize. Uh, the uh, the task. Okay, so first we test the robot without uh, compliant controller. So as you can see, without a compliant controller, the robot may get stuck even at the beginning. If it apply too much force to the dove, it will get stuck. And now that's a performance uh, for robot with compliant controller. As you can see, the robot uh, can guarantee proper force interaction uh, with the dove. So the, it's a combination of the learned uh, motion and the compliant uh, control of force to perform this uh, task uh, successfully. Okay, and um, in addition to uh, imitation uh, learning, uh, we uh, recently we also uh, try to uh, uh, study uh, reinforcement uh, learning. 
uh, this uh, is because uh, some uh, sometimes uh, we uh, need the robot to have need the robot uh, to have a better uh, generalization because for uh, in imitation learning uh, you can only demonstrate a limited uh, a very limited number of them uh, demonstration you can only provide a limited demonstration to the robot uh, with the limited uh, scenarios well the advantage of reinforcement learning is that uh, you can take advantage of simulator uh, to let the robot to explore in uh, a very large number of uh, situations such that uh, the the skills uh, uh, will be more generalizable uh, after the uh, reinforcement learning. But the uh, disadvantage is that if you do a uh, reinforcement learning on a physical robot, that's quite expensive. Uh, after uh, hours and hours uh, of learning, the robot can easily break down. That's why we use a simulator. Well, you can do a uh, uh, you can do a uh, uh, learning simulator uh, easily. Uh, is uh, cost uh, uh, much less, but uh, a, a, a big problem is that the the policy learned in the uh, simulator, how do we transfer to the uh, real, real robot without problem? Uh, because um, even if you can build the model, kinematics, dynamics model uh, perfectly in the simulator, you cannot model the environment uh, perfectly because uh, there are a lot of uncertainties in, in the environment. So uh, from simulator to the uh, real scenario, the transfer of skill uh, that's a typical seem to real or problem. Um, so there are a, a number of methods uh, proposed in the literature like uh, the uh, randomization and uh, the adaptation to uh, increase the robustness uh, of the uh, policy learned in the simulator. Well, uh, we want to uh, develop a more uh, effective and a simpler and effective way to transfer the uh, skills uh, from the sim simulator to the real scenario. We proposed a uh, so-called uh, simulation uh, twin uh, method as shown uh, here. Um, so uh, usually in the simulator, uh, the force feedback uh, was uh, ignored, uh, but uh, for our uh, experiment, uh, especially for the uh, interactive task force is uh, very important. But for simulation in simulator is uh, actually quite hard, uh, especially for uh, interaction with deformable uh, objects. Uh, well, uh, our uh, method is to uh, uh, we, we propose abstract uh, state uh, in reality. When we capture this state, we can uh, fit uh, back into the uh, simulator and to correct the policy uh, trend in simulator and then we uh, feedback the new policy uh, to the uh, real robot. Uh, and uh, by using the simulation twin module, we can synchronize uh, the, uh, the, the uh, abstract state in the uh, physical world and the uh, virtual environment uh, in the simulator. Okay, so uh, this shows uh, the, the experiment uh, we test our strategy. So uh, we create uh, hundreds of uh, virtual box robots to learn in the simulator uh, for opening uh, opening uh, a drawer task. Uh, this is uh, looks very uh, simple task, but actually um, the interaction between the gripper and the uh, handler uh, with for with force feedback is not uh, that simple in simulator. Okay, so first the robot can reproduce uh, the 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 reproduce the, the job successfully. Now, if we do not use the simulation, uh, the 
simulation twin, and you change the location of the drawer. Uh, we move it back or move it forward uh, 4.5 centimeters. Uh, you can see without simulation twin, it will fail. And by using the simulation twin, the robot will correct uh, its uh, policy to perform the task uh, successful, successfully, uh, even if you change the location of the drawer. Well, uh, so this is uh, uh, some preliminary work we, we did uh, uh, towards uh, uh, reinforcement uh, uh, learning uh, in combination of uh, simulation twin. Uh, we, uh, we hope to do more work uh, uh, along this direction. Okay, that's the uh, uh, end of my uh, talk. And uh, I would also like to uh, take this opportunity to uh, to show that uh, uh, we are the uh, collaboration group at uh, Bristol Robotics Lab. And uh, these this, uh, animations uh, shows uh, what we do. Uh, we uh, uh, study uh, advanced, advanced uh, human robot interaction uh, interface and we uh, tolerate both uh, robot manipulator and a mobile robot. And uh, on the left, it uh, shows uh, our recent uh, monographs and uh, edit books on collaboration, robot control, and robot learning. And uh, if you are interested uh, uh, in our research, feel free to uh, contact me. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Yang, for uh, offering us very excellent and impressive you know, presentations. So now I think let's uh, move to the question and answers uh, section. So for our audience, is any question uh, you know, f from your side? Because I, I believe most of you are doing researches you know, in robotics and controls, you know, the uh, with applications. So please feel free to discuss and then you know, with our, you know, distinguished, you know, speaker, Professor Yang. So any questions? From our audience, you need, is there any question regarding theory and application? Because I think that I, Professor Yang, have provided with, you know, uh, many ex good, you know, practical examples regarding the human-like robot control and manipulation skills learning, and uh, we also, you know, uh, seeing many interesting, you know, the uh, videos and you know the practical examples. Uh, that they have already carried out in the in the lab, yeah, which is very very impressive, yeah. So, any questions from our audience? All right, I think some audience leaves the message expressing that today's presentation was great and don't have any questions. Yeah, <laughs> that's good. <laughs> that's great. Anyway, yeah. So I, uh, pr Professor Yang, I do have several, you know, the questions. Uh, regard, yeah. So first of all, regarding the multi-modal skilled modeling, and uh, yeah. So basically, you have implemented for the position mode. So in uh, in addition to the adaptive control, so are you considering any other control methodologies, uh, which can be, uh, you know, good candidate to, you know, ensure, uh, you know. Uh, same performance or similar performance as the adaptive control. Yeah, for your application. Uh, yeah, we, we we use adaptive control is that because we we have observed adaptive uh, behavior in uh, human motor uh, experiment. Uh, so in human motor uh, experiment, uh, hum all the human subjects they demonstrate a strong uh, learning capacity. Uh, with adaptation to different scenario, uh, especially in different uh, 
force field. That's why we uh, uh, we we uh, assume uh, adaptive control uh, framework when we do modeling of uh, human motor uh, behavior. Uh, we also do. We also tried uh, iterative uh, learning control uh, for, uh, and that's uh, all, that's also very useful, especially for some application in rehabilitation. Uh, uh, iterative uh, learning control is also uh, very useful. But for uh, real time uh, performance, uh, we prefer uh, adaptive control. Mm. Yeah, and to uh, improve the uh, robustness. Of the uh, learned skill for uh, for uh, generalization purpose, uh, actually we also considered a uh, robust control. Uh, so uh, by using a uh, uh, neural adaptive control, actually we also have a robust uh, flying uh, atoms in the controller. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, there, yeah, thank you, thank you very much. Yeah, because the this combined technology would be very, very, you know, the uh, popular for you know our robotics applications. Yeah, because the, you have uh, you know already done many years research on the human-like you know robots. Or uh, so I haven't touched you know that much in this area. So because for this human-like robot, so the human should be included in the in the whole you know the the system. So for because different people have different, you know, skills or different, you know. So uh, if someone without, you know, uh, significant, you know, skills, or if they don't, you know, carry out this kind of, you know, uh, operations, does that affect the final performance of the whole, you know, the, uh, controller? Yeah, that's a very good point. Uh, mm. At the moment, uh, all the demonstration. Uh, come from uh, a single demonstrator, okay. but uh, we 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 do consider multiple mm. multi expert demonstration. Mm. In that case, um, so we we think that uh, each expert maybe uh, has has expertise uh, in one single uh, skill. Mm. So we can combine uh, multiple uh, experts skill. Uh, so we can combine uh, different skills uh, to uh, perform a, a, comp uh, a co complex uh, a task. Mm. So we learn one skill from a single expert, another skill from the second expert. Mm. Uh, that's possible. We have tried that. Okay. All right. Because the yeah. maybe it's good for the uh, design control to accommodate as many you know the, the humans you know as as possible. <laughs> yeah. That would be yeah, the, huh? you know, great for the in future applications. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Thank you. And I. Uh, to, yes. Uh, the final topic you have introduced regarding that uh, simul uh, simulation twin base is this just the you know the new technique uh, or the you know the uh, is some uh, you know the uh, more research have been carried out on on this area. It's like the the virtual, you know, the uh, command, you know, generator, right? For 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 the robot. Uh, actually, the idea comes mm. from a uh, digital twin. Digital twin. Uh, oh, we, okay. Yeah, we borrowed the, the idea of digital twin, but we fit that uh, into sim to real uh, problem. Uh, our idea uh, is a uh, simple yet effective. We we open the policy in the the control policy in the simulator so that uh, when the real environment is different from the virtual environment we we we, we build a, a new framework called abstract state we synchronize the virtual environment with the actual environment in terms of abstract state of course, mm. we cannot build a virtual environment 100% uh, same as uh, the physical environment, and that's not impossible. So that's why we, we developed abstract states. That's um, high-level state. Mm. Uh, as as long as the virtual and the real environment are same in the terms of uh, abstract state, we are able to guarantee uh, uh, the the control policy in the simulator can be directly used in the mm. uh, physical environment. Mm. 
Mm, okay. So that's the idea of a simulation train. Okay, all right. Yeah, this is quite new because I, I haven't, yeah, you know, uh, read similar, you know, references. Yeah, so in, in terms of the environment, so which kind of environment, uh, you know, does this simulation twin, you know, uh, be, uh, you know, uh, executed or, you know, the carry out for the predict application? Which kind of environment are you running this simulation in the uh, ROS oh, or any other environment? Yeah. Uh, we use ASIC uh, ASIC Dream. Okay. All right. As, yeah, we use a simulator ASIC Dream. Yeah. Uh, it's like the because, uh, from from company or directly. Yeah, it's an open open source uh, simulator. Oh, open source. Okay. All yeah. Right, yeah. ASIC Dream. Yeah, ASIC Dream uh, mm. is friendly for a uh, force simulation because uh, uh, in the literature most. Uh, uh, in, in in the uh, literature, your most uh, learning they do not consider force interaction, mm -hmm. but uh, we are particularly in, interested in force uh, contact uh, tasks. Mm -hmm. That's why we need to do the uh, force simulation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This will give a uh, you know the preliminary uh, verification for the you know design methodology. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, because you have already done many years, you know, researches on the robotics area. So, uh, could you please give some, you know, the further directions for our audience, you know, uh, for you know, on which certain parts or which certain areas, you know, is the is quite attractive or quite, you know, the uh, promising in the next few years? Would you please give some, you know, uh, some good ideas or directions, yeah, regarding, yeah, this <laughs> this point? Yeah, that's a. That's a real, uh, really a big question. Mm. Yeah. So, um, I, I think personally, my opinion is that uh, now, uh, artificial intelligence is mm. rapidly, rapidly developing and uh, has made a huge impact. I think um, the integration of uh, learning and the control uh, will be uh, something that we need to uh, explore. Uh, for uh, robot manipulation, um, because uh, conventionally we we the control theory has been developed very well. We have stability convergence. Uh, uh, we have rigorously established a stability proof and a convergence proof. Uh, but uh, now we uh, we see uh, towards uh, uncertain environment uh, towards. Uh, interaction in, for the dynamic task, we need a uh, more uh, learning based approach to uh, for the planning uh, of the robot. So uh, how to combine uh, control and uh, learning based approach, I think that will be uh, that will be worth uh, for our research effort. Mm -hmm. Mm, all right. Yep. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Young. So, uh, any more questions from our audience? All right. So, if we don't have any question, I think, uh, yeah. So, uh, let's you know complete for today's presentation so thank you very much again for professor young for you know giving us this you know impressive presentations and today so uh in the next few you know uh in the future definitely we would like to invite prof young to uh to come to Perth to give us you know the face-to-face -face presentation regarding the you know the uh future researches about you know robotics so uh, let's look forward to you know the uh, visits next you know the visits by you know, Prof Yang coming to Perth. Thank you very much, Prof Yang, for thank you, thank yeah, you thank for the you. invitation. Yeah, thank you.